Okay. Okay, here we go. All right. Uh, just to introduce a little bit about what exactly freediving uh, is and consecutive, uh, consecutively what freedive photography is. Uh, but then I also don't really want to bore you with me just presenting for the next uh, one hour. So we thought that we could try to make the session as interactive as possible. So feel free to ask questions uh, on the chat and Julia and I will do our best to answer them as we go. Uh, and underwater photography is already something that's you know, quite rare and unique in the general scope of photography itself, uh, let alone you add this thing called freediving, um, which you may or may not already know. Um, but I'm sure you have a lot of questions here. <laughs> and then so hopefully by the end of this session, uh, you will have a sort of different perspective on maybe what freediving uh, was to you before and after, uh, and perhaps what underwater photography uh, may entail. Uh, and perhaps uh, some of you might even be willing to try one day. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's uh, go. Okay, so what exactly is freediving? So when you think diving underwater, um, you may think of scuba tanks and uh, using all these equipment, uh, all these gears. Um, freediving is essentially the opposite of this, where you don't breathe, you hold your breath as you dive underwater. The definition that they give is that freediving is the practice of holding a breath and diving underwater without the use of any breathing apparatus. What you see here are three photos uh, that I shot during the uh, freedive competition over the last couple of years, uh, where these athletes compete against each other um, to see who can dive the deepest and who can dive the longest. Um, there are many different uh, sort of categories or disciplines in freediving competitions. Uh, where one, you might be diving without fins, like you see on the first photo, uh, or second, you might be diving with by fins, uh, and thirdly, where you dive with something that looks like a dolphin tail. Um, in fact, I might just show you real quick, since you can see my video, right, still? So, so this, this is a freediving fin, a typical freediving uh, fin, which is made out of fiberglass, actually. You can get some in plastic as well, uh, which is more for basic uh, freediving uh, users. This fiberglass actually helps to see how flexible it is. So when you kick with your fin like that, it helps to propel the water like that. Okay, if you can see, it's really powerful. So the propulsion that you get from kicking with these things underwater is really, really strong. Uh, this helps you get to places faster, but most importantly, it helps you to save energy. Um, another one here. <laughs> This is called a monofin. So it looks like a dolphin tail. It's what you see on the third photo. This is um, for the discipline called constant weight dive, uh, where mostly the world records are usually set on these things because it's way more powerful than normal fins. Uh, it's made out of carbon fiber, or it could be made out of fiberglass as well. There are many different styles. Uh, and then there are other things like this, which is my tiny fin, which I used to uh, when I do photography, because having a small short fin is quite, quite important uh, for me when I don't want any of the fins to be in my frame. Anyway, I think I went a bit off topic there, <laughs> introducing my fins. Um, um, so you might be thinking, how deep do these people go? Yeah. So the world record today uh, is set by this Russian man called Alexei Mochinov, who is actually also the same person who designed these things. This is his brand, actually. Um, his record is 130 meters using that dolphin fin. Um, so that is 130 meters going down and 130 meters coming up because you have to come back uh, to breathe, right? Um, in Singapore, the record is around 60 to 65 meters, I believe. And actually that photo on the, on the right that you see is, uh, is actually a Singaporean. He actually holds the national record uh, for the Singapore's deepest dive. <clears throat> My personal record so far is uh, around 50 meters. Um, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's really not about depth, but, it, but anyway, I mean, it's so, so people go quite deep, basically, essentially. Uh, I'm not sure what deep is uh, for every one of you here, but 50 meters is, uh, you can imagine one whole length of a big pool. So it's quite deep going down and you have to come back up as well. So, so you might already be thinking, why, why would you 
why would anyone do this? It's crazy, right? Um, this is something that uh, everybody initially thinks, even myself. If you simply look at free diving from the outside, like we did, it looks very scary. Uh, these are some of the words that, uh, that pops up immediately. Things like scary, it's crazy, <clears throat> it's dangerous, uh, and it's a very extreme sport uh, for the adrenaline seekers. And you might even think, what's the whole point about holding a breath? It doesn't make, make no sense. Why would you risk it, right? And I thought so too. I thought these people were crazy when I first saw it. And I immediately thought I would never in my life do anything like this. But now I'm doing it. <laughs> and I'll explain to you why. So despite what it looks, what many people don't see from the outside is that free diving is actually the polar opposite of being extreme or having adrenaline rush. Um, if you remember, or if you, if you can imagine, free diving is done on one single breath. And that means you need to maximize usage of that precious oxygen that you have. So being pumped with all this adrenaline and like excitement is actually very bad uh, for your dive because you will use up your oxygen uh, very quickly. <clears throat> so instead, uh, a free diver needs to be as relaxed and as calm as possible. Um, not only in your body uh, physically, but also in your, in, your, in your head mentally, because this is where most of the oxygen actually gets used up um, inside our brain. Um, and people uh, you know, say that this sport um, is still reckless. Yeah? You shouldn't push your limits uh, like this and risk your lives. However, freediving is also about being aware of your limits. So and being in uh, sort of control of your body and not just your physical ability, but also in control of what's going on in your head psychologically. So I hope you see, it's just a very quick summary, uh, no, just a quick description of what freediving is and, uh, from what it looks to what it, uh, it is from the inside. Um, so yeah, so freediving looks very crazy extreme from the outside, but from the inside, it's actually all about being relaxed and peaceful. And this is why uh, this sport often gets misunderstood and, you know, it gets labeled as being extreme and but in reality, it's actually more closer to being more like meditation than anything else. And I think we, uh, we showed a video just now before when we were waiting for uh, people to join, but this is a video that shows an example of my, my what free diving looks like. <clears throat> it's actually me <laughs> diving at the competition back in 2017. I don't think it's the same video that Julian just showed earlier, but I think you will be able to see that it's, it's all about staying relaxed and calm, but also at the same time being focused and uh, being, aware of, uh, being aware of what's going on and in control. So I'm gonna play this now just to let you guys see what it's like. Oops. Oh, 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 sorry, something happened there. I won't play that again. Sorry about that. They said, they said. Fish at top. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Koi Ueno from Japan. Going free motion to 35 meters, dive time 2 minutes 8 seconds.
I think you get the point. So basically, I hope that you guys can see that despite what it may seem like from the outside, that it's all about extreme adrenaline, everything is about pushing your limits. It's, I hope that this video shows you that it's the opposite, where it's all about being calm and being collective and going slow and being more aware of what's going on instead of just going crazy and just pushing your limits. Uh, this is a very famous uh, uh, freediver called Natalia Mojanov. She's actually the world champion um, uh, when she was 60 something years old. It's interesting because it's almost as if the older you get, the better freediver you become. And we will talk about more about this later. But she basically says that freediving is all about the euphoria that comes from this weightlessness. So it's all about seeing how beautiful the underwater world is, but it's also the joy of understanding uh, yourself and your thoughts and experiences at a deeper level. And, and you might be thinking, okay, this is very poetic. Yeah? It's very, but it's really something like this. This is also another quote from her. She says that free diving gives you an unforgettable experience. It's not just a trip to the underwater world, but also a journey into yourself and a way to learn and self-develop. It's not just a sport, it's a way to understand who you are. Um, I really love this quote because it, it really is, uh, for me, a journey of understanding yourself and being aware of the situation that you are in. Because by doing so, by knowing what's happening in the present moment, you learn to know exactly what you need to do at that specific moment. So, so I feel like this is the kind of the key to improving almost anything in this world, which is why I think freediving is such a good tool to help so many people out there to kind of better yourself in anything that you can think of doing. And this includes photographers because it forces you to be sort of in that present moment and think of, um, it forces you to be in that present moment. I think that's what's most, uh, it's one of the more important thing as a photographer to be able to do. I think it's a, good, it's a good skill to have to be able to be present in the moment, to know what you're capturing in order to to establish the photo that you're looking to get, um, which I think we can speak more about uh, later. But at this point, I think you might be thinking, so, you know, is freediving just about being Zen and uh, meditating and just, you know, is that the only reason why freedive? What I love about this sport is that there are many, many different reasons why people freedive, um, or more exactly why people may hold their breaths underwater. For example, here, is uh, a bunch of pictures of recreational freediving. Yeah, it's also known as snorkeling, uh, which is something that uh, I believe many of you have already tried once, uh, twice before. And in a way, this is freediving too, because it's just not as serious or you're not competing against anybody of how deep or how long you can hold. You're just there to enjoy and see the beautiful sort of like weightlessness and the, uh, you know, the spectacle of the ocean, it's more casual. Um, some of these photos were taken in Asia, some uh, some are quite far away, like all the way in Tahiti and Tonga, but the ocean is still an ocean and it's kind of connected everywhere. You might get different shades of blue, but it's everywhere for everyone to enjoy. You don't have to be a freediver to enjoy, right? Some people freedive for, uh, for food. See? You see, some people freedive for food, like you see in these photos where you know, they're spear fishermen or traditional fishers from villages who dive to collect their food for their family. Some people may be fishing like this with a spear for fun, as a hobby. This uh, is actually a sport in itself. So there's, there's that as well. And then there are some people who free dive just to look pretty <laughs> or like who like to dress up as a mermaid and uh, whip the tail around and sort of realize their childhood dream or whatever it is. And, um, or just being an underwater model and just feeling good at it. Um, and then there are also cases where a lot of the freedivers who join freediving because they simply love how it feels. And they dive to constantly try to attain this state of bliss or their form of meditation or um, to realize other health benefits, uh, which we can also talk about uh, later. Um, and then, some free, uh, people freedive in order to challenge themselves. Like you see in these photos, this is all a competitive freediving where you see how far you can go, you pursue the goals that you set and you achieve it. So it's a very 
goal oriented, motivated, sporty sort of, uh, uh, you know, people who want to realize their competitive aspirations. And, and I guess for someone like me, <laughs> I mean, I do all of the above. I do all of the above. I compete. I do it because it feels good. I do it because I love being in the ocean and feeling nice and meditative and all. But I also free dive specifically to take photos. And uh, this is uh, something that I thought we could share more about in this, in this uh, session. There's actually a very valid reason why I choose to free dive to take my photos. Um, so let's sort of go and move on um, and explain why on earth do I free dive to take photos? And why don't I just use a scuba tank? Um, many people ask me this question. Like, why do you hold your breath to dive for just two minutes, you know, one or two minutes, when you can just get a scuba tank and dive for one hour? It's a very valid question, but, and sometimes it makes a lot of sense to use scuba tanks, um, depending on what you're shooting. But then there's a very big difference to scuba diving and free diving. And let's take a look, a uh, closer look at that. The photo on the left, you see, you have all a bunch of gears, a typical equipment that you use for scuba diving. You got your regulator, you know, to breathe the air coming from the tank. Uh, you got your buoyancy compensator or the BCD, which is something you use to inflate or deflate to go up and down. There's a computer for you to see how deep you are, how much time you have left on your tank. Oh, sorry, that was the gauge. The gauge is how, uh, how, how much air you have left in your tank so you know uh, you're not running out of air. And then you've got a big massive tank on the back of your shoulder, which is going to be very, very bulky. So not only is it more gear, that you gotta collect, it's gonna be very expensive. And also it, it's going to start restricting your movement underwater. Some people may say, okay, you know, it's, it's okay. You underwater is weightless, you don't feel the weight. But as a free dive photographer, you wanna be moving around to get into position and you'll be going up and down, up and down, trying to find the right angle to be in that moment again, right? So just being free and being flexible is actually very important in what I do. And then there's other risks. Uh, of uh, DCS, which is decompression sickness, which is uh, something that you get when you stay on the wall for too long or you go up too quickly, or you, you, there's a lot of rules and restrictions actually when you are scuba diving. Um, and, and the fact that you are 100% reliant on your equipment, like there are equipment failures all the time, but in free diving, the only equipment you have to worry about is yourself. So there is no way that an equipment will fail out of, out of your control. So in a way, I feel that freediving is much, much more controlled and safe you know, as long as you are, you are responsible for understanding what is happening as your body, as the equipment. <laughs> so in terms of safety, yeah, I'm going to dive into this uh, illustration that shows what happens when, uh, to your lungs when you dive underwater. So imagine your lung is this red balloon. Don't, don't worry about all the gray shaded area, just the balloon is your lung. So on the surface of the water, the lung is at its normal size. When you dive 10 meters, the atmospheric pressure, there's a pressure in the water which starts to crush on your lungs. And that pressure is double the amount it is on the surface. So what happens is that when you go 10 meters, your lungs becomes half the size. If you go 20 meters, your lungs becomes one third of the size. So as you go down, the deeper you go, the smaller your lungs become. You get compressed because of the pressure. And as you come up, the opposite happens when your lungs starts to expand. Now imagine if you are scuba diving, let's say you are 20 meters, your lung is already one third of the size and you breathe in the air and then you <laughs> flow up it's going to expand until the balloon pops. So this is why there are many, many rules and restrictions in, in uh, scuba diving, where you cannot go up too fast when you're breathing, you have to go slowly and also do things like safety stops uh, and all, all these things. With free diving, you're not breathing in any air, only the one you bring from the top. So you can go as quickly as, uh, as fast as you want, go up as fast as you want. There's nothing to worry about. Again, more control. Um, so, so yeah, so this is why it's actually more dangerous to be, I, I feel that, uh, to be on a scuba. Um, 
And then there's other things you gotta worry about, like nitrogen buildup, uh, because you stay down for so long that you get you get a buildup of nitrogen that you gotta expel out, and all these kind of things. Free diving really has none of that. You don't have to even think about it. it it's not even uh, used up in any of your brain spaces. So it's much, much more sort of like, mm, I would say clear because when I was scuba diving, I mean, I've been scuba diving since I was about 13 years old. And, <clears throat> and until I started free diving, I was always scared about the water, to be honest. I also had my fear. Like, what if my tank malfunctions and I have to go up and I can't? Or, uh, you know, all these fears start to get into your mind. And I was like that. Um, and scuba diving does that too. And I, was, I will usually come up from the surface with very little oxygen uh, left in my tank because I'm hyperventilating and I'm breathing heavy. And then I, after I, take, I took a free diving course, that's when I start to realize like it's about overcoming these kind of fears and it starts getting better. But we can talk again about this more later. Yeah. Okay, so here's another video of uh, a free dive competition where I'm actually taking photos of the athletes. So I'm also free diving without scuba tanks uh, and taking photos. And this is just so that you can get an idea uh, of what it's like. Um, I might just play and kind of talk as I, as I go. <clears throat> One basically, so I was so basically wait at the bottom of maybe about 10 15 meters for the athlete to come down, and I'll take the shot and go off. And then the next athlete drops, and I will go and do it, do it again. And I basically sometimes wait from the top or I follow from the top. And uh, it's a lot of moving up and down, up and down. And I think this is why most, most, uh, the biggest reason why we don't scuba dive is not allowed when we're taking photos of athletes. Because of this, you're constantly going up and down, up and down. And usually there's about 20 to 30 athletes competing. And you have to dive at least twice per athlete. So that's like 60 dives in one day. It would take about uh, an average of maybe about three, three hours, maybe four hours. And so on a scuba tank, I don't know, maximum is not, not more than one hour usually. And you can't dive comfortably one after the other. So there's many, many sort of merits in, uh, in doing free diving while you take photos. I just wrote this video. <laughs> I'm not sure why they chose this music to be honest. <laughs> but so yeah, I, I hope I hope that um, that you get an idea idea to see that there's a lot of swimming involved. There's a lot of going up and down involved. There is really no use for scuba tank because it's not only uh, going to be bulky and hard to find position, but it's going to be very dangerous. <clears throat> and then there's uh, another big difference uh, between scuba diving and free diving. And, and although they're both about being on the water, they're completely different in terms of how you enjoy it. Uh, there's a famous quote from Umberto Pelizari, who's a, a big grandmaster of free diving. He, he says, Scuba divers dive to look around where freedivers dive to look inside or look within. Um, and I think this is why freediving is often related or associated with yoga and meditation because it is this similar practice of internal awareness. Uh, it is this practice of looking inside, uh, which I believe is what many people are drawn to in this sport of freediving to begin with. Um, but again, people dive for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, and for me, uh, it's not just one, it's several mixed into one. Um, I love, um, uh, I love this whole Zen aspect and the spiritual elements of freediving, uh, but I also enjoy the competitive aspect of freediving, where you challenge yourself and you push to, to sort of improve yourself bit by bit while understanding what's happening to attain a certain goal. Um, I also love the fact that this sport is, uh, forces you to be sort of healthy and eat well because um, 
or sometimes never eat at all. Uh, so it would, it would be good for people who want to lose weight, actually, because if you're in the ocean with a full stomach, it gets very uncomfortable because of the pressure. So a lot, and, and, and plus, if you're eating before a dive, the body starts to digest while you're diving, and that's going to use up a lot of oxygen. Again, diving, a free diving is all about conserving as much oxygen as possible, um, and you don't want to do anything that increases that activity. Um, but of course, if you want to do like macro photography or underwater shots, then it's uh, underwater shots of small little things that you have to position yourself or fix the camera onto something, then of course it makes sense to be scuba diving. So I'm not, I'm not dissing scuba diving photography at all. I'm just saying that for the thing that I do as a freedive photographer and a sports photographer, it just makes no sense to be using a scuba dive. Um, and it's actually a lot more efficient, it's cheap, it's cost effective and it's safe. This is one of my, the biggest reason why. Um, and however, there's also one a very important reason uh, why I choose to free dive uh, when I take photos. And that is because, because you're not breathing in air, there's no bubbles, there are no noises from the bulky gear behind you. And so you become much, much, much uh, quieter in the water, which means that you can get close to these animals and fish without scaring them away. So when swimming with whales, for instance, it's actually illegal to be scuba diving because you're, the bubbles that are uh, coming out gets, gets to them and uh, sometimes they feel threatened. And so it's, it's usually not even allowed. So if you can't scuba dive, you have no choice but to free dive. Um, and if you can't even go to you know, some depths, then it's gonna be very hard for you to shoot a close up of any animals. Um, so I think, okay, so I'm gonna stop my presentation here, I think, because I've been speaking for a while and I wanna keep it as interactive as possible. But I hope that you, you now have a better understanding of what freediving is and why I feel uh, that freediving is the way to go in order to take photos underwater. Um, there's still a lot of, a lot of things that uh, I, you know, that I can share about freediving photography and freediving in itself. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask and we can go over them in the chat. Um, otherwise, I think Julian, uh, you got some questions already prepared and uh, mm. we can get to answering it. Just gonna yes. close my... Yeah, of um, course, uh, everyone knows that this is kind of like interview session with you. Just yeah. to find out a little bit more about you at the same time too, yeah. right? So um, how is uh, everyone doing? Oh, uh, what do you think about the pictures? And uh, do you think that is? It's still a crazy spot in a way. <laughs> I still think it's crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so you see, there are there are people who say that okay, oh, now we see all the questions coming in, which is great. Okay, mm -hmm. now while you guys are really warming up, okay, I have a small little poll for you, okay, just to uh, get to understand you guys a little bit better. Yeah. So you probably want to fill up your questions in this poll. Uh, that we uh, then we can look at it and to see you know um, uh, what is your interest level and uh, what do you uh, do in terms of uh, underwater photography? Ah, great, thank you, thank you so much for that response. Okay, coming in, yeah, interesting. So great, okay. <laughs> so let's see, yeah, let's see. So okay, great. We'll just leave a little while more for this uh, poll to come in. And thank you for your questions. Please keep them coming in. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Okay. I think that uh, Koi san, you have done a, a fantastic presentation. You know. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really don't know what to say, but uh, <laughs> because <laughs> you know, I the questions I have for you, I think they are going to make things difficult for you. You know, oh, but, no, uh, no, no, there's there's no yeah. such thing. No <laughs> but it, it may also be the answers that uh, our friends will be looking at. You know, yeah. So mm. I'll be asking on their behalf. But uh, obviously, if I uh, if you have some other questions, please also uh, put them into the chat. Okay, and then uh, we'll pick that along. Okay. So we have uh, quite a number of response coming in, but uh, not from everyone yet. Yeah, so we'll just leave another 30 seconds, okay? Uh, well, I think <coughs> I'll just answer some of the questions in the chat, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, brilliant. So I mean, uh, so Ron, Ron asked uh, if there are any courses to learn from. Um, there's, there's actually quite a lot of freediving schools in Singapore that you can learn from. Um, mm. I'm actually also teaching myself uh, with the company called Zen Freediving. Uh, but there's not only one, there's many several. So you can actually 
go to all of them. It's not like freediving community is actually still very small, although it's growing. Um, doesn't mean that if you join one club, uh, you know, you're supposed to stay there. Uh, although there are some politics like that, like people like to be in a team and all that. But then to me, I don't try to associate myself to any club. Although I teach in one of the clubs, I still hang out with other freediving schools. Sometimes I go by myself with my own friends. And so freediving is actually quite a, um, uh, interesting community. So you don't have to be worried about that. So you can feel free to choose and pick, uh, some, you know, based on the instructor might be more of the more efficient uh, choices. And if you like, I will give you using the links to all the schools later. So you can maybe share it, you know, uh, share it to the participants. Mm. Yeah. I'll contact you. Oh, you'll contact me. Yeah. I can actually be your guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could do that too. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a lot of people say, okay, if you don't know how to swim, it might be a bit of a challenge for you. However, freediving is all about overcoming challenges. And this is one thing you should uh, mm. look into. Just because you cannot do certain things doesn't mean you cannot do it forever. Everything is about trying and, and improving yourself. And I think that's what freediving has really taught me. Um, you'll be surprised how bad I was at holding my breath and how okay I am at it now. Mm. And it's not because I'm physically uh, superior than people or anything in fact i was really bad that everyone else around me was so much better but then it is about overcoming those challenges to fix certain problems is the process of free diving and that's what will help you attain even if you are not a swimmer you will probably be able to learn swimming as you go because okay one other thing is that swimming techniques that you learn in the swimming pool with a swimming coach it's going to be very different to swimming technique that you learn as a free dive you don't want to be using a lot of energy like you do like on a butterfly or a you know proper breaststroke you want to be as uh soft as possible and use the least amount of energy so so uh back in i mean I, you know I, the, the schools that i can recommend you it's just going to be something i look up on the internet so i wouldn't have any personal relationship with swimmers but for free diving schools yes i do so i could definitely shoot you some uh, recommendations Thank you uh, for your answer, uh, yeah. Kui San. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, uh, Alan. Okay, and uh, we can see from the from the polls, right? Okay, wow, you see, uh, the interesting thing is uh, there are no divers here. <laughs> <laughs> you see, oh, so which is great, yeah. And uh, I salute you guys, you know, for your adventurous spirit, okay, and to find out really a, a bit more about the sport, you know, and how you could actually do that for photography, you know, uh, which is also something that I'm seriously also very interested in. And uh, perhaps uh, this is something that we can do in future, koi mm -hmm. Uh You know that uh, um, one of the most beautiful shots that I've seen just now are those of the mermaids. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I'm. I know that you can do that in Singapore, right? Uh, yeah. and and that's something that uh maybe like a workshop that you can organize to do that, and then uh in the safety of the swimming pool, for example, um the participants could go down with a camera, and then uh could quickly take some shots of that and come back. Yeah, come Absolutely. back up, uh, for air. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes. Absolutely do that. Yes. Yeah, so that will be something that will be very interesting, uh, folks, you know, that uh, it'll be a different dimension of the kind of photography that uh, all of us are so accustomed to and will be something like a new challenge or a new new skill that we can learn. And uh, Koei San actually also organized things like that, but I think that we can only do that after the after COVID, right? Yeah, because of the restrictions and uh, yeah. So, so do keep a lookout on that uh, because those are some of the things that we'll be uh, probably looking at uh, in the future, okay? Yeah, and uh, thank you, Naiji, for the question. Naiji is our very, very good supporter for all our webinars and thank you so much for that. And uh, what, what cameras are you using for the underwater shoot? Mm. Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, I feel like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm an expert in camera. I, I haven't used all the cameras out there, so I cannot speak for everybody's behalf. But I've been only predominantly using a Sony since the very beginning. Uh, it's not like I am going to push to say Sony is the best. But for me, this camera is very familiar with me. So I, I am able to sort of quickly change settings whenever I want, even with my eyes closed. And I think this is what is going to be very important, especially for underwater uh, shooting, because more so important than the camera. I think having a good housing is going to be more important. You see, because sometimes, you, okay, you, the camera goes inside the housing, but these buttons 
are not always extensive. Sometimes when you need to access a certain button in your camera, but your housing doesn't have the button for it. So, so more, I feel that, that the more important thing about looking at the equipment is like to look at what housing is available for your particular camera that you're using and making sure that you can access, you know, the functions that you need to. Um, some housing you cannot even change or dial um, the, the zoom ring unless uh, you, you uh, make some adaptations. Uh, some you can't really change the aperture and shutter and ISO all three together. So all these things you have to, to think about. Not, I wouldn't say that one camera is better than the other. I would just say more focus on the housing that you put into and that you can actually manually control all of it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hope that answered your question, uh, Naiji. Okay, and who are the people diving up together with the athletes? Yeah, that's a great question. Mm. So freediving uh, is all about being safe, right? Um, well, I mean, every sport is all about being safe, but with freediving particularly, there is, of course, a risk of people that maybe push too much without being responsible for their own limits. And then they, and what happens is uh, usually on the way up, there is a chance of people to lose consciousness. It's called a blackout. That's when, it doesn't mean that you're, you're past, you're dead. It means that your body shuts down in order to stop you from using any more energy. And it is actually your body's natural response to save you from the ocean. It stops all the airways to suck in the water, which means that it prevents you from drowning. So it is actually blacking out. When you see videos of people in the ocean maybe blacking out, you, you know, they look like this and then they just drop dead. But it's actually helping you to not suck in water. Mm. So it's stopping you from getting worse. And so when that happens, as long as there's somebody there next to you or watching from the top, goes and grabs you, puts you into the surface, you'll be 100% safe. <laughs> because right. after a blackout, what 100% what of the time happens is that a couple minutes later, that person will start to have like a natural automatic response to breeze all of a sudden. Mm. And if that person is on land, when that happens, you come back consciousness again and you right. just be normal. But if you are still underwater when that happens, then unfortunately you will be sucking in water into your lungs and you drown and therefore you, you pass away mm. or you drown. So, so, so blacking out is actually not even um, something that in freediving considered as the ultimate uh, scary uh, elements of it because people, it's almost as if they're used to it. They're like, oh yeah, this guy's about to black out. So we just put him up, you know what I mean? So it's not as scary as it looks at all. It's mm -hmm. actually, uh, once you understand the logic behind why people black out or why the body stops functioning, is to stop, uh, is to protect you. And, and uh, so the people around that you see in the dive is there to make sure in case anybody starts blacking out or showing any symptoms, they are able to catch you and bring you up. Right. Have you experienced any blackout before yourself? Um, unfortunately, I'm not very proud of this, but yes, I have. And, um, and that was because I was, uh, it was in a Singapore freediving competition in the pool. Uh, it is a discipline where you hold your breath and see how long you can just float on the surface of the pool. And, and all these nerves of competition, nervousness, uh, all these things start to affect my, my mentality, my physique and everything. So even though I was able to use to, you know, hold my breath for four minutes, plus, plus, four minutes, 30, but during this competition, I wasn't feeling too well. And before I even hit four minutes, I somehow lost consciousness. And, uh, and someone helped me bring me up. But this is, of course, in the scenario of competitions and when people are actually trying to push. And unfortunately, I made that mistake of not understanding what my body was feeling at that day. Although I may have done it hundreds of times on that day, on that environment where I was feeling a little bit of a nerve, uh, then uh, you, know, you have to be able to understand what your body is going through. And mm. fortunately, that was a big learning for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really about learning more about your own body, your own limitations. Yeah? Yes. And your, yeah. So really knowing more about uh, both the mental state and also the physical state of your body, yes. yeah, which is really great. Okay. 
So let's take this question from Nelson. Nelson is saying that uh, how to stay in one vertical diving place with strong current underwater. Do you experience that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this is that's a very good question. Um, I mean, of course, we try to tend to find diving sites, or you know, when a free diving competition is held, we usually try to find spots that don't have current, so the body don't go, you know, in all directions. And it gets really hard for you to swim up against the current. So, but for safety purposes, for that purpose, we use this thing called a lanyard. I'm sure you can see, this is where it's like a little rope where you tie onto your wrist like this. And this carabiner clips onto the line, the, the line in front of you. Right. And what this does is that it helps you from, from uh, drifting Good. away because of the current mm. or because you lost orientation or because you, you might not be even opening your eyes when you dive, which most people don't. They take off the mask, actually, and uh, they could drift off, and this prevents you from that. Um, right. So there are certain protocols that we use to make sure you are not going all over the place. Mm. But also to answer your question of staying vertical, completely vertical, you, it's also about training and also about relaxing your body. And these are all to do with your technique and um yeah, there's a lot of variables uh, to keep your body straight, but that's one of them. Right. Yeah. Mm. Thank you for sharing so much already <sighs> about free diving. You, oh, know? And, uh, you, you know something, Koei san. Uh, you see, you, you have been speaking for the last 50 minutes, but uh, I think people still know very little about you. <laughs> How about uh, you tell us a little bit more about yourself because I understand you did not dabble with free diving for a long time, you know, or mm. even photography for a long time, you know, but you are already a successful photographer in that sense, okay? Mm -hmm. So what were you doing before you actually found these two passions? Yeah, so thank you for this question. I think it's a topic that is uh, quite interesting for me to talk about because all the things that I've done before freediving and photography have really led me to where I am today. Okay. Um, and every little phase of my life really had to let, led me to something. And that something led to another. Uh, it sounds very obvious, but mm -hmm. I realized that if I didn't go through those experiences, I would have probably never been in this field. Right. So I'm going to try to share back my screen, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Because <clears throat> um, I have a bit of a... One second. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. So, folks, if you have questions, please keep them coming. Okay. And then uh, we'll pick them up. Okay. So, oops, that's not it. Here it is. This is ah, a here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 really quickly, I was born in Tokyo. Now you, you know my age. I was raised in Hokkaido. And when I was about six years old, my dad decided to move to Singapore. So our whole family migrated over in the 90s. Um, so I was very young. Uh, and then I finished my whole high school thing. Uh, during, um, you know, I did my high school. And during that time, I picked up a lot of uh, weird sports, like break dancing or something that I used to do every day. And ultimately, this became my first ever job. Uh, as a, as a part-time job uh, where I was teaching breakdancing uh, as part-time after school. Uh, so after I graduated from this high school, I thought that it was a good idea to move to Melbourne and study in a university to get a degree. Mm -hmm. Like everybody does, right? I thought, I mean, although I knew that I was more interested in things like art and sports, but somehow I ended up choosing to study business because... I simply thought that this is the kind of stuff that I need to study in order to get a good job, to make enough money to succeed in the future. So this is my, my childhood, uh, I mean, my understanding of what I'm supposed to do uh, based on what I've been taught. And so that was, the that was the beginning of my first mistake or my first realization, I would say, because after I graduated for, with my degree in Melbourne, I couldn't even find one job. So my learning from this is that if I can't even find a job with a degree, then I should have just studied something that I enjoyed, like something I like creative or in the arts field or something sporty related. But 
you know, it was kind of already too late now at that point. I was already 24, 25 and thinking, okay, I can't study another degree. So while I was struggling to find uh, this job after uni, I saw an advertisement in my school campus looking for a Japanese soldier to act as a movie extra. <laughs> <laughs> it was for a big Hollywood movie uh, called The Pacific, uh, directed by Steven Spielberg. So I was like, oh. no, no, sorry, Tom Hanks was the oh, director. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Why not? You know, since I can't find a job in my field, I uh, might as well just do this for now. And so I went to the audition and got this job. So the, for the next 10 months, I was actually basically working as a movie extra. Right. And then in a movie set, usually there's a lot of waiting time. Some days you are called in to the set, but you are not used for the whole day. So you just wait, sit around for your turn or whatever. And so me and my friend decided, um, why don't we just kill this time because it's so boring to sit there with your clothes on, uh, with all your uniforms. Well, let's just start practicing breakdancing since we are, you know, just, just for fun. And so we did that to kill time. Then a few days later, the directors came to us and said, hey, we've seen you dancing. We think maybe we can use you um, instead of hiring some expensive American stuntman from overseas. We can just pay you a little bit of sum and we train you up to be a bit of stuntman to do minor roles. And so we're like, oh, yeah, the pay was decent. And I was like, why not? You know, you got nothing to lose. So, uh, so, so I did that and I got trained to be a stuntman for a while. And then even after this film was done, I was still considering to pursue this as my main uh, thing for the, couple of, for the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, you start to think, okay, I cannot be a stuntman forever. Uh, you know, it's not sustainable. Uh, you know, it's also dangerous uh, and all my friends all my childhood friends were getting proper jobs and going to places and all this stuff so I was thinking okay I need to do something proper yeah? get back into my reality or whatever that was so I applied for all the big companies no one re replied except for one and that happened to be Google which is known to be the world's number one place to work at mm -hmm. like why not? <laughs> but anyway, so, so, and they were only interested in me for this interview because I put in my resume, World War II Japanese soldier acting as a stuntman. Like, they were <laughs> like, who is this guy? <laughs> 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 so just because of that, I was asked to come in to speak and talk. And after several interviews, I managed to get the job at the best company in the world. Wow. Okay, so this, hmm. and then I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. You know, my life is complete. Like, you know, I was like, everything was so good. Um, and although it was my first corporate job, I thought that I'm happy to be here forever. Hmm. And, you know, everything was good. The perks were, were good and the job wasn't too difficult. And I felt like I was living this dream. But then after three years or so, we start having this next realization. Um, you know, when I'm supposed to be very happy uh, working for the good company and all that, but my life wasn't, was super comfortable. It wasn't, there was something missing. And I was like, what is this? Like, I'm not supposed to feel this way. Like, you know, uh, I'm not supposed to look for more when I already have a lot. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I realized that I was almost feeling very scared because things were too comfortable or too mundane or something. And uh, that there, there has to be more to life than Google. And, and I just thought, okay, like if I didn't get into Google and I work my way up the career ladder or something in hopes to get to Google in the future, and if this happened to me at that time when I'm, let's say, 50, 60 years old, years old then what a waste of my time. <laughs> so I start thinking, oh, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Maybe if I'm not happy to be in Google, which is supposed to be the best place to work at, then I better get out. And I thought I need to do something. So. Mm -hmm. So I made that decision <laughs> on the fourth year to quit everything, sold all my stuff and uh, packed my bag into the 40 liter backpack to travel the world. And that's when I bought my first uh, camera, which was the A5000 uh, okay. entry level uh, mirrorless camera from Sony. Uh, right, I see. So yeah. that was how you got started with your photographic journey, actually. Well, yeah. So, oh. well, yeah, photographic journey. Um, I had no idea of shutter speed, ISO, aperture. I was just <laughs> le learning on the go while I traveled to all these beautiful places and taking yeah. photos. Mm. And um, 
I mean, yeah, I'm sorry to take so long to explain the story, but but because I had this opportunity to kind of just restart and refresh, I mean, I was already 28, 29 years old, yeah. quitting everything and going on this like self road, road to self discovery sort on of a journey, yeah. like a lot of people think, uh, you know, it's about. And it really was because it was very eye opening. And mm. I, 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 re- I learned so many new things that, that uh, I never used to think about, think right. about yeah. what I eat, what I consume, how I think, how I treat my body, and all these kind of stuff, which started to, to naturally lead me to this sport of freediving, because mm. it's all about that, actually. Um, right. Freediving is almost not a sport, I feel. <laughs> and, and, it's uh, a way of life. Yeah, it's a way of life. It's a healthy mm. lifestyle. And it's also a way for you to sort of manage your body and take control, you right. know, ownership of your body. And so one thing led to another throughout. And I think if I didn't have done breakdancing every day after school when I was like 17, 16, 17, maybe I wouldn't even be here. And because I was kind of reckless in that sense to try something, I feel that is the only reason why I was able to land to this. I mean, I'm not going to say um, you know, leaving Google was a great idea, but I'm just going to say that without it, I would have never found this passion that I now have for freediving. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I think yeah, that's you, really you, you haven't actually been doing photography for, for a long time. It's just six years, you know, uh, but the thing is that you have actually won quite a number of awards uh, globally, right? Yeah. yeah. So would you like to share with us what uh, have you done the six years? You know, what awards have you yeah, actually won? So... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think I forgot to really explain my point of, um, so after this traveling thing, right. while I was traveling to all these places, it was about a year and a half I was traveling around, just doing what I want, uh, just going to plenty of places. And one of the photo I took was in Bolivia, in the Uyuni Salt Flats okay. in South America. And this is where, during the rain season, where the water has not entirely dried up yet. And mm. so you still get, a nice reflection on the water on the lake that makes it look like a gigantic uh, mirror. Right. Um, and it was the first ever image that I submitted um, thinking, okay, so I got an email from a newsletter from Sony Alpha saying, oh, there's a photo competition. Submit your photos. And I'm like, okay. I have a lot of photos in my travel and I submitted this one image. <laughs> and then it just so happened to win. Right. Not just the editorial category, but the the grand winner uh, of this competition. The grand prize, huh? Yeah, the grand prize. Right. And, and because of that, that allowed me to upgrade to a proper camera, well, not proper, I would say from an A5000 entry-level camera to mm. an A7R2. Right. Camera. I was able to upgrade to that kit. And mm. plus, an opportunity for me to follow one of the Australian underwater photographers to do a workshop or to attend his workshop. And that workshop so happened to be in Tonga, which is where you can sh- swim with the whales. It's I something see. that I've always wanted to do. And, and uh, this is that time when uh, we went there, my first time actually diving in the water with the whales. Oh, wow. And already I was, I was so excited about free diving. So it just makes so much sense. I already had all the gears. Uh, I knew how to dive and I knew all about uh, being calm around these animals so it just everything started aligning and so so everything started from winning that competition yeah i see yeah so and i'm then, i'm sure you didn't stop there right and then uh what happened after that uh you you have actually gone on to win also some other competitions that i know of <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i mean since then it's been so since then i've been polishing up my skills or in terms of photography in terms of diving mm-hmm. and and just, you know, a lot of things in general. Um, and this is just to, uh, just to, to show that I started with this camera. I have it right here. This, this is the first camera that I bought. It's the A5000. Right. And the one with the yellow is what I won from that competition, from that first competition. Mm-hmm. And since then, I've upgraded some cameras along the way, honing my skills to the requirements that I need, including photography and and since then, these are the, the list of awards that I won. Mm-hmm. Everything is shot. Actually, na- about 90% of them is underwater. <laughs> and, so yeah. we, we see a long list here. Which one is actually the most significant to you? I, well, f- well, for sure, the first one that I won 
uh, which was that Uyuni Soul Flight, is because that's how everything started. Um, but the second most important one I feel is this uh, one from Sony, when I came second place at the Sony World Photography Awards. Mm, um, right. I think that for, yeah, it's this one. So here is the, the photos. So it's like a series of photos. It's all about freediving. And, okay. and I wanted to show to the judges that this is not what it seems, like how I explained. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so folks, here we go. You know, this is basically how you combine your two passions together yeah. and then uh, to get the shot and uh, you join a competition and you win that. So this <laughs> is really amazing because I think uh, one reason is because these are also not the usual set of photos that you will see in a competition, you know, it's kind of like uh, quite rare to see and uh, that that obviously has also put it in a very, very good position, you know, to, to win that as a very strong contender. Mm. So yeah, we could see that. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So now let's move on a little bit more about on photography. Okay. And uh, the thing is that, um, okay, we were talking about you conducting tours to Australia actually before COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so you're thinking of leading groups there uh, to learn free diving and also obviously to uh, take some shots underwater and, and also on the land, like the resort, there are some shots that you can do. Mm -hmm. So um, will you be looking at that again uh, post-COVID, okay, or any other destination uh, that you're looking at once it's actually safe to travel again? Yes, for sure. So this is something that I'm definitely, I was, I was actually scheduled yeah, with you, Julian, to, yes. to, to run this workshop to the Great Barrier Reef. Just to show a bit of example of what you can expect there is a mm. bunch of turtles. <laughs> 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 Perfect for learning free diving as well, because the water is very mild. It's not oh. very deep, crystal clear water, mm. and you've got a beautiful place to stay. And so I thought it was a perfect opportunity for people to learn like how I learned uh, when I started free diving and photography. Right. Mm. And there's a, a very famous uh, place for all the mantas to come uh, to clean their body in this coral. So mm -hmm. it's called a coral cleaning station where the mantas gather and all the small little fishes come and clean his body. And so mm -hmm. you have a, an opportunity to take amazing uh, creatures like that. Yeah. Yeah, when you see them in front of you, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a game changing sort of experience, I think. Nice. Yeah. Hopefully we can get to travel to Australia very soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there are so many other places that, uh, you know, around our, in Singapore, it's very accessible too. Uh, mm. Some can be as close as Malaysia. Some can be a little bit further out near wow. Bali, mm. which I can kind of show you some photos. This is, although this is a free diving photo, um, but there's a lot of free divers in Bali and you can find them, uh, everywhere but then uh, this let me just yeah this is raja ampad as well it's more for shallower water more for corals a little uh, bit more for a holiday destination like kind of place mm -hmm. and it's a place where yeah a lot of a lot of photos like this kind <laughs> of holiday is uh photos can be taken i believe <laughs> yeah oh, really nice it's always just about being in the blue Usually there's not much background. It's just the athlete or the animal. So right. going to shallower water like this, um, where you can see vegetations, a lot more like coral fishes, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it can add to uh, an interesting, interesting photo. Right. Oh, great. Yes. You so a lot of uh, opportunities. In fact, you can just uh, be scuba diving and then uh, doing the correct technique for breathing, for example, and then you can be a free diver, right? Yes, well, yeah. I mean, there's quite a bit difference, again, from scuba diving to free diving. But yes, I mean, as long as you are able to compose yourself, right. and, um, take responsibility for your own body, then there's nothing can go wrong, I think. Mm. Mm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, when we talk about breathing, uh, Koi san you know, I was thinking of this. Uh, maybe we can get everyone to, to participate in free diving safely. What do you think? You know, uh, I had this idea uh, because I understand that we can we can technically practice free diving while on land, right? Like where we are sitting now without uh, actually getting into the water. 
do you know that uh, guys we can actually do that <laughs> so maybe like... maybe the uh, koisan would you like to share your secret on this you know <laughs> or how to hold your breath or how to uh maybe improve your your breathing a little bit okay. holding your breath a little bit uh, mm -hmm. so that we can practice that on land Okay, and maybe everyone can do this together uh, while we are on this session. Okay, and uh, try and see how long you can hold your breath. Okay, but okay. before that, before that, yeah, we need to master the technique from you. <laughs> yeah. How about to make it more interesting, you okay. do it without me telling you anything and you ah. hold your breath okay. and then see how long you can hold your breath until you give up. And maybe everyone can just type their, their minutes or seconds on the chat box and then then I'll show you some secrets. Let me find ah, them. great. Okay, let's do that. How about that, uh, everyone <laughs> here? That? Yeah, so you just time yourself, okay? Uh, get ready your stopwatch, for example, and then you hold your breath and see how long you can hold your breath. Uh, yeah, just the longest time, and then you key that into the chat box, okay? Yeah, so one, two, three, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll wait and see some response. Yeah. We'll wait, we wait for, for people to hold their breath. Yeah. So meanwhile, meanwhile, let's just uh, discuss a little bit more. What are your plans for the future, actually? Well, well, see, I mean, I'm still, I guess, you know, after learning freediving and doing photography, um, I'm, quite, I'm quite satisfied to just continue doing what I do because this is what I enjoy. And mm -hmm. so I'm willing to spend the rest of my my working career to utilize this as my main activity. So, right. and it will be grateful if people who who are there who are interested in this similar life or want to learn will be able to uh, to utilize my service. But if mm -hmm. not, I mean, my plan for the future is really simple. Since freediving life is very simple. You just want to be healthy, eat well, and do things that you enjoy, and not right. to and you know to respect your body and just kind of like be okay with it so yeah just right. for one second i mean 65 seconds from 65 now. seconds that was a well done <laughs> okay any other contenders <laughs> 65 seconds is the holding record for now <laughs> this is pretty good yeah when i first oh. started free diving or my when i took my first ever free dive course i was doing one minute 60 seconds of breath hold that was my maximum mm, 60 mm. seconds i see yeah I think, I think people are still holding their breath. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Ming uh, has managed 75 seconds. Wow. <laughs> Great. Nice. I think I can only do 15 seconds of what Ming uh, did for 75 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can do a bit more. And I'm sure yeah. after I teach you this specific thing that you can do, mm. I'm pretty sure that everyone will be able to increase it yeah let's see let's see we wait for the rest okay yeah okay. so i do agree with you that life is short uh koi san yeah you right. really need to do what you enjoy you know wow. and that uh yeah so um i wish you the very best that you can combine your coaching uh, mm. together with your photography and also leading the trips around the world you know yes. to different parts of the world for free diving and for photography yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, welcome. So, wow. Okay, Alan, uh, hold Amazing. for two minutes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Here we go. And uh, Ron has done 106 seconds. Wow, impressive. impressive oh. timing. Wow, sweating. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's really that's, that's good effort. That's really oh, good. Right. Effort. Wow. Okay. <laughs> How many lungs do you have? <laughs> <laughs> oh okay so yes yeah and what i want to ask about nitrogen intake yeah nitrogen intake so nitrogen builds up when you are i mean okay i'm not too familiar but in free diving you do not have to worry about nitrogen building up in your mm -hmm. body um as opposed to scuba diving then this is something of your concern but yeah. and that's why um but so free diving there is no such thing actually there is no there is no build up of nitrogen if, okay, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Warren, but um, I'm not sure exactly what exactly you mean, but we don't inhale nitrogen nor oxygen when we dive, so there, there is, mm, yeah, I'm not sure. There's no, there's no nitrogen intake. It's only you have that when you are doing scuba diving, yeah? Yes, so mm. 
Yeah, so sorry, sorry. When you are going really deep, um, okay, not even deep, but for a prolonged duration of time, then your body do start to build up nitrogen, and that could be quite toxic. This is where you get nitrogen sickness. So that's that's probably what you're referring to. But in a free dive, you're not going for you know t- five minutes, ten minutes. Uh, you're just going for a few minutes, mm. maybe two three minutes. So that's you don't have any nitrogen to worry about. Oh, okay, so. So you're talking about surfacing fuzz. Okay, so this is something I uh, kind of touched on before. But if you remember the balloon uh, illustration, when you go up and down, when you go down the, uh, the ocean, your lungs gets compressed and get smaller and smaller. And as you come up, it gets larger and larger. So the reason why surfacing fast is bad in scuba diving is because when you go down to, to certain depths, your lungs become small. And if you inhale oxygen, like you do in scuba diving, you are suddenly inhaling oxygen at a depth of 20 meters. So when you come up with that air, that air is going to be much, much bigger than what you started with. Therefore, you could blow your lungs. And that is why surfacing fast in scuba diving is not allowed or it's very um, tightly monitored. Free diving, in the other hand, you're not breathing in any oxygen in the water. So you can go down as fast as you want go up as fast as you want, nothing to worry about. Mm, I see. Okay. So hope that answers your question, Warren. Yeah. And the next question for you, Corey san oh. How long can you hold your breath? <laughs> Good question. So <laughs> I, I used to be a heavy smoker, uh, you know, and I only quit after 14 years of smoking cigarettes during my high school times and only then, after when I was traveling around and realizing, reshuffling my mind, I quit cigarettes. And, and I never had a big lung capacity to begin with. So I mentioned that I, my breath hold was one minute when I started. Mm-hmm. Everyone around me was doing about more than that. One minute, 30, maybe two minutes. Some was doing three. And so I thought maybe I'm not meant for free diving. But uh, you'd be surprised because right now I'm doing four minutes, 30 as my maximum uh, breath hold. And that is, I mean, it's like, that is basically three and a half times, no, four, four and a half times more, uh, wait, about four times more than what I started with. And nothing has changed physically. I haven't really done any, you know, aerobic exercise or anything like that. Uh, it's all just really mentally training how to tolerate um, and also learning some techniques, which I'm going to kind of show you. Uh, right. And you do that within a couple of months, you will see improvements. And this is all about improving about yourself. So freediving improvements, you see it very fast. Okay. Hmm. So what is, the, what is the golden technique that you <laughs> want to share with us? The secret golden technique. <laughs> so I'm going to have to open it. Is my, is my slide open? Huh? Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, we can see that now. I don't want to be very scientific. And I'm definitely not a scientific person, but... I can say that when you inhale air, which is the red arrow going into the person's stomach on this, it goes into your lungs and it gets picked up by your blood vessels. The oxygen gets picked up and it gets delivered to all your different organs, uh, your your fingers, your, your nose, your eyes, your hearing, your brain, your movement. And then it gets, it gets, it comes back into the other, other part of the lung and converts into a, what's called CO2. It uses that oxygen to put it into energy and then it expels it out in a form of carbon dioxide, which is something that comes out when we breathe out. So this happens every one or two seconds when we breathe. Just normal breathing in and out, all this thing called the gas exchange happens. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to think about it, but this is happening. But what you realize is that this means that as long as you increase the intake of oxygen and reduce the amount of CO2 buildup or your tolerance to use up so much oxygen, then you can increase your breath hold. Anyway, that's, that's the bit of the boring side of things. So how to increase your breath hold? There's three things that you need to do. Inhale, in, learn the technique to inhale as much as possible, which is what I'm going to show you. Number two is to be able to relax without using much energy. This is something that you have to practice on your own. It's not a technique that I can show you. Of course, there are some stretches you can do, but then um, yeah, this is really 
your, your, this way you work on it. Number three is to train your brain to cope with this urge to breathe. At the end of the day, it is, oh, one, one thing I forgot to explain is that it's actually not oxygen, the lack of oxygen that is making you want to breathe. It's actually the buildup of carbon dioxide. Right. So in fact, after you, let's say, after the, um, uh, let's say Chris, who the 55 seconds had to give up, that's not because you don't have any more oxygen left. You actually have plenty of oxygen in your body to last at least a good five minutes. Everybody does. It's just a biological thing. But it's the buildup of CO2 that we are so used to expelling out straight away, like when we breathe, that the body cannot tolerate. But you can use your brain to teach your lung to tolerate that buildup of carbon dioxide. So again, it's all about teaching your body and then teaching your brain to cope with it. Mm. But for the number one, inhaling as much as possible is something that I can show you. So instead of just going, there are three simple steps. Okay, I'm not sure how to show this in a video though, but, but uh, should I just, okay, so when we breathe, normally we breathe with our chest like this, right? Yes. But there is another breathing technique where it helps you to relax, and that is called the belly breathing. For those of you who do yoga, you might know already, or meditation, you might just take on my shirt if that's okay. Because, so here, you can breathe with just the stomach. <laughs> this is called belly breathing, okay? So instead of going, and then just fill up your body, you, you, you First step is to breathe from your stomach and then breathe on your chest. And then lastly, you breathe into your, into your throat. So there's three little compartments, if you like, to put your breath in. So again, I'm going to do it again. Right. So I expel out all the air. Breathe from your stomach. Breathe from your chest. And then that is how you get the maximum amount of air possible into your body and you try that and hold your breath and you will probably see a good 10 to 25 percent <laughs> jump in your body. Why? interesting interesting <laughs> about that do you need to actually breathe out first well oh, sorry, you... yeah, i didn't explain that properly but yes it's good to breathe out all the carbon dioxide out right and then put in fresh oxygen in because Using a three-step breathing. Yes. So, <laughs> Three parts breathing. Okay. I mean, it's all about, yes, yeah, so maximizing oxygen in. So some people, professional freedivers, they actually do this thing called packing, where mm -hmm. you do all the breathing, and then you, you keep packing in oxygen into your body. More than the body can naturally do. And that is the technique that professional uh, freedivers Right. You, in order to maximize to the limit. And that's why they do a lot of stretching in order to increase that intake of oxygen. Okay, yeah, great. So uh, our friends here today hope that uh, you have uh, learned the secret technique and maybe you can even practice that uh, wherever you are, even when you're sitting now and practice that and that will increase your, your hole, you know, your, your breathing. And uh, next time when you do, for example, your uh, uh, when you go snorkeling, you can actually practice and use this technique, you know, and you can stay underwater for a longer time. And obviously also um, joining Kohei, uh, Kohei-san on uh, some of the trips or maybe even the training and also look out for the workshops that we'll probably do uh, in time after COVID, once uh, things really open up um, a bit here in Singapore. So with that, uh, are there any last questions uh, from all our friends here today? Yeah, and thank you so much, Koei san for all the sharing and you know that uh, all the hard work that you have put in to prepare the presentation, actually. No, no worries. Yeah. Thank you, thank you guys for joining. I'm, I'm sorry that it took a bit of a longer than expected. I, guess I just realized we're over time. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I was having so much fun seeing these numbers and I would love to see more numbers come in. Uh, once you try that technique and you try to hold your breath, I would love to see whether it improved or not. So, uh, yes. Yeah, wonderful. So, okay, yeah. Uh, we don't see any more questions coming in. So I think that uh, we should uh, call this uh, 
yeah, we should uh, call an end to this session today. And we really appreciate uh, that you join us here today. Thank you for sharing your weekend with us. Mm. And uh, with that, we we would like to wish you a very, very good uh, week ahead. Okay. Yeah. And uh, stay safe and see you again in the very, very near future. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. If you have any questions, feel free to question, uh, message me. Find yes. me on my Instagram or find me on my website. Or just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're getting in contact. Um, I would love to share more and there's a lot to share. And uh, even if you'd like to come and join me in my pool sometime, I could do some uh, some quick crash free diving courses as well. Yeah, so, yeah please get in touch with Kohei-san. I'm sure it's very easy. easy to find him on the internet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not really out there, out there online, but then once you get to know me, I'm very easy on. So you, mm -hmm. you'll be able to find me easily then. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, and see you all. Yeah. Thanks, guys.